Our next speaker is coming to us via Skype from Ottawa, Canada. Ms. Jamie Stuckless worked as a, travel, a school travel planning facilitator with Green Communities Canada from 2010 to 2012. In this role, she developed and coordinated a, a program aimed at engaging high school youth in active school travel in Ottawa. She is now coordinating Bike to Work Month in Ottawa, as well as Ontario's first Youth Bike Summit, which is coming up in October later this year. Jamie enjoys biking along Ottawa's pathways in her new cruiser bike and is happy to be living in her hometown again after many years away uh, working and going to school in Toronto. Please give a warm welcome to Jamie Stuckless. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, share my experience working uh, to promote active school travel at high schools in Ottawa and to uh, learn from the experiences that uh, you guys are sharing here today at your conference. Um, so I'll just uh, dive right into the presentation. Um, as Amy mentioned, my name is Jamie Stuckless and I'm going to talk to you today about adapting school travel planning for high schools. So next slide. Uh, in terms of the project background, uh, the, this was a pilot project that was run in Ottawa, which is uh, Canada's nation's capital, and it was run between September 2010 and December 2012. Um, while, this project, while working on this project, I worked for Green Communities Canada, which is a non-profit organization here in Canada. Uh, I worked with seven high schools across the city. And uh, because it was a two-year project with so many schools, I won't be able to touch on everything that happened throughout the project during this presentation. Um, but I do have a written project overview that's accessible online uh, via PDF. So we can certainly share that with anyone who's interested in learning a little bit more about uh, the data and some of the actions that were undertaken during this project. Um, and uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, the project did conclude at the beginning of January 2013. Uh, this was not the scheduled time for the project to end. We wanted to go all the way till the end of this school year. Um, but unfortunately, because of uh, labor disruption, um, we couldn't get into the schools for almost four months because the teachers uh, were... Um, not running extracurricular activities and then during that time I was offered a new position so we had to, we decided to end the project when I left that um, so we do not unfortunately have uh, any follow-up data to share with you to kind of, to analyze um, but there was still quite a few lessons learned so I hope that it will be um, a useful project to look at for you so next slide um, because this presentation is entitled Adapting School Travel Planning for High Schools, I figured I should give you a little bit of an overview of what the original school travel planning model is. Um, and essentially, school travel planning is a national project that's aimed at making it safer and more convenient for families to walk and bike to school. Um, it was currently running at, uh, in all the provinces and territories across Canada. And the project has a real focus on data collection, of really understanding what's happening at the school and why, um, before we work with the community to develop a two-year action plan. Um, the action plans that are developed by the school community focus on the four E's of education, enforcement, encouragement, and engineering. So we really do try to take a well-rounded approach at looking at all the different ways that walking and cycling can be encouraged. Um, and in addition to the school committees who work on these projects, uh, the school committees, by the way, are comprised of principals, um, administrators, teachers, parents, and in some cases, even students. Um, these committees were also supported by members of our municipal steering committee, which was comprised of city officials, uh, members from the school board, the transportation consortium and public health. Um, at the level uh, at school travel planning with the elementary schools, the primary level of engagement was with the parents because it was assumed that they're making most of the decisions about how their children get to and from school. Next slide. In terms of adapting it to the high school level, we decided to work directly with a group of students and a lead teacher um, because we thought at the high school level, students are the ones who are uh, much more involved in making the decision about how they get to and from school. Um, and we wanted the project at the same time as focusing on encouraging active transportation. We always wanted, we also wanted to focus on youth engagement and helping youth develop leadership skills so that they can continue to work on similar projects throughout their uh, high school and university careers. 
The high school project that we set up has four phases. Uh, the first of which was the program setup, where we met several times with the student group to uh, ensure that they were interested in having the project and to make sure that they had the capacity to take on the uh, two-year project. And then we had the school sign a two-year letter of agreement so that the commit commitment was in place uh, on behalf of us and on behalf of the school that we were going to be contributing time to this project. Uh, the other three phases I'll go over throughout the presentation, but they are um, the establishment of a peer-to-peer -peer transportation survey, the development and implementation of an action plan, as well as ongoing team building and creative thinking exercises. Next slide. So I wanted to share with you some of the results of our data collection. Um, this, uh, the results that I'm going to show you represent just over 800 students across Ottawa. Um, so overall, we saw that uh, there was very low levels of walking and cycling amongst high school students. 12% of students were walking and less than 1% of students were biking to school. Um, so this is you know, fairly similar to what Sophia was showing earlier, a slightly lower rate of active transportation. Um, but then within that uh, active transportation, the bulk of it being walking with very little biking. Um, the weather could have played a little bit of a, of a factor in terms of the low active transportation. However, most of the surveys were done in the fall, with the exception of one that was done in the winter. Um, so, you know, weather might have played a, a factor there, but uh, overall, not a lot of walking and biking going on. So we thought, okay, maybe this has to do with distance. Um, the kind of the area that the school board has indicated that students can walk within is three kilometers. So any student who lives within three kilometers of their school um, is told by the school board that they can walk and bike and they don't receive busing. Um, but only 22% of the students who lived within the three kilometer radius of the school actually walk or bike to school. Um, so we thought, okay, well, if it's not distance, maybe it has to do with access to a bicycle. Um, but 79% of the students who were surveyed said that they do have access to a bicycle for the trip to and from school. Um, another interesting factor that we looked at uh, with relation to distance was that of the students who were driving to school, 72% of them actually live within three kilometers of school. And at one school, um, actually in my old neighborhood, my old high school, this was actually as high as 95% of drivers live within a three kilometer radius of the school. Um, so we definitely learned early that uh, getting the word out there about uh, how far students live and how long in terms of you know, time it will take them to walk and bike would be a huge uh, focus for us. In terms of the decision of who of how students get to and from school, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the project, we worked directly with the students because we thought they were the ones who were making the decision about how they get to school. But we actually found um, while working with them that uh, their parents were playing quite a big role. So in the second year of the study, we decided to put in a question asking students who makes the decision. And we saw that less, of ha less than half of the students we surveyed are actually the primary decision maker in how they get to and from school. So that played an impact um, on uh, what, uh, what we did throughout the study. So I realized that I forgot to say next slide. So I'm not sure if you're on uh, the slide there that says who makes the decision about how you get to school. Is that, what, is that what's showing now? Perfect, okay, I see some head nods in the audience. Thank you. Um, great, so we'll go to the next slide. So we also asked students what their thoughts were generally about walking and biking to school, just to get a sense of how people feel about it. Um, so there was some fairly positive responses, such as uh, walking and cycling is good for the environment, it's good exercise, it's easy, it's time spent with friends, it's fast, and it's healthy. Um, and we also had some negative responses about walking and cycling, such as that it's far, it's boring, it sucks, it's unsafe. Uh, students were fairly honest in saying that they were too lazy to do it, um, which I think we all think at some points in, our, in time, um, and that it was too far and that it was a tiring exercise to do. Um, so, you know, some honest opinions, uh, good and bad, about uh, what students are thinking about walking and cycling. So next slide. Great, so now we should be on slide nine, which says action plan highlights. Um, and I wanted to share with you some of the things that we did with the students to help them encourage their peers to think about walking and cycling um, as an option for them on their way to and from school. 
Um, several of our schools organize what's called a slow bike race. Um, these usually take place inside where students already are so that it doesn't take as much uh, coaxing to get students to come out to your event. So usually in the front foyer or in the cafeteria. And basically it entails bringing in two bikes and having students ride them as slowly as possible. So they're basically just balancing um, and trying not to put their feet on the ground and whoever um, crosses the finish line last wins. So it's really just kind of a an easy way to share the fun aspects of cycling and to have visibility for the club and for um, the projects that the students are trying to undertake. Um, several of our schools installed bicycle racks. This is not something that the school boards here in Ottawa provide. Um, schools have to pay, raise money and pay for them themselves. So we helped students um, by providing a small honorarium for them to install bike racks to provide safe parking for students who wanted to bring their bicycles. Um, and several of our schools organized active transportation breakfasts where students who chose to walk and bike on a specific day were rewarded with uh, fresh pancakes or a smoothie um, before the school day started for as a reward for walking or biking. One of the initiatives that was really popular in our second year was the idea of a walk and roll challenge or walk and roll passport. Um, so one school did this throughout an entire month and another school did it just during a week. But essentially all students were given a passport and uh, if they walked or biked to school, we had volunteers standing around the school in the morning um, and they would get a sticker or a stamp or a check mark uh, to indicate that they walked or biked that day. And any student who walked or biked at least once during that month or that week was entered into a prize draw for some pretty great prizes. We had uh, tickets valued at over $200 for a local concert. We had free bus passes up for grabs as well as a brand new bike from a local retailer. Uh, so it really did encourage students and even teachers to start walking and biking to school during this specific challenge. Uh, one of our schools was very creative and started a uh, school-based bike share. So I'm not sure if Dunedin or any nearby cities have uh, a Bixie bike or a, or a municipal bike share. Is that uh, common in New Zealand? No? Okay. Um, so basically what we did at this school was uh, students identified that they didn't have access to bikes to get to and from school and to get to their part-time jobs after work. So we bought five low-cost bicycles from a local bike shop. Uh, we had mechanics come in and uh, help the students fix them up so that they were ready to ride. And then we provided them for free for students and staff to use throughout the year so that they could get to and from school, maybe to, you know, uh, to the local cafe for lunch or to their jobs. And uh, as far as I know, the five bikes were being consistently used by both uh, staff and students to get around by bike. So that was a creative solution to one of the problems that was identified. Um, one of our schools, which is pictured here in the newspaper article that I have up on the slide, did a stakeholder walkabout where they invited the local city councillor to come with them and walk around the neighbourhood and talk about, um, you know, the connections for pedestrians and for cyclists. And a lot of really great uh, action items came out of that. And not to mention a great feeling um, amongst the students, feeling like they had really been listened to and the councillor um, actually struck up a youth committee um, to deal with the development that was happening around the school after that. So it was a really positive experience. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight one of the real action plan um, positives was uh, committee members trying new things. And I'll get into it in a minute. Um, but a lot of the students who came to our committee to promote walking and cycling weren't actually walking or cycling themselves or necessarily interested in trying it. Um, so what we really did throughout the two years was scale it back. And instead of focusing on running events for the entire school, we actually started to run events and uh, um, challenges that focused on the people who were actually on the committee and trying to get them to walk and bike themselves. And uh, many of the students did try it and uh, had positive experiences and started walking and biking more more often. Um, so that was a really great uh, kind of a learning piece for myself and for my colleagues about uh, event organization. So we'll go to the next slide. And I'll just briefly talk about the fourth piece of the project, which is the critical thinking activities. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the students who came to the table weren't walking and cycling themselves and weren't necessarily interested in um, challenging their peers to try walking and cycling. They didn't necessarily um, feel that it was it was positive or that uh, there was any downside to driving, um, which is totally fine. But we wanted to kind of have that conversation and spur some critical thinking amongst the students as to maybe why they could be promoting walking and cycling amongst their peers. 
Um, so the slide that I have up here, the reality sex poster, um, this is the original poster was actually an ad that was published by GM in uh, college newspapers across the states. And it said reality sucks. And the photo underneath it was actually a cyclist who was really embarrassed that his friend who was driving caught him on a bike. Um, so it's kind of saying, isn't it embarrassing to be caught by bike? Don't worry, we're having a sale. You can buy a more affordable car to solve that problem. Um, so I thought this isn't necessarily the message we want to be sending to young people. Let's talk about, let's revamp what this ad means. So we would, um, I would show a really great video to students um, that uh, actually I'm now wishing I had included in the presentation, but uh, you know, hindsight is 2020. Um, but uh, it basically is a video that uh, students in Europe made that uh, is people on bikes actually mocking kind of the inconveniences that cyclists have to, that drivers have to go through, you know, waiting at stop signs, getting their parking places stolen, um, getting a parking ticket, that sort of thing. So we watched that video, talked about maybe the reasons why walking and cycling can be positive, And students would make these posters as if they were promoting walking and cycling to their peers. So two of the, the big Big ones that came out of this were, uh, you know, the idea that the buses are really crowded. A lot of students were taking the bus, even though they walk, lived close enough to walk or bike. So the idea that uh, stop, stop standing on a crowded bus. A bike only has one seat and it's saved for you. Um, and another creative idea that students talked about was this idea that uh, stop spending money um, to pollute, uh, pump up for free and save the air. So the idea that you can pump up your bike tires for free as opposed to pumping up with gas, which costs quite a bit of money. Um, so we did these exercises throughout the two years that we worked with students just to get them talking and having fun with each other and also thinking critically about uh, the things we take for granted, the conveniences we take for granted about uh, driving. Next slide. Great. Uh, so some of the challenges and lessons learned. Um, I definitely encourage uh, uh, students and teachers and public health officials in Dunedin and uh, to those of you listening uh, online to work with youth to encourage active transportation. And I just wanted to share some of the challenges and lessons learned that we had so that you can uh, best shape your project. Um, one of the big challenges that we faced was this idea of the cool factor around um, walking and biking, um, and that it wasn't focused on safety. Um, what I mean by that is at the elementary school level, when we sat down with parents kind of on, you know, the first day of school travel planning, um, it was really easy for parents to identify intersections and safety concerns that were real barriers for them to walking and cycling. So we could, you know, work on addressing those and talk to public officials and, you know, start to have this conversation about safety while also building um, kind of a uh, positive momentum around walking and cycling. But when we sat down with high school students, um, the main barrier was really that it just wasn't something that they were doing and that most of the cool and older kids were driving. Um, so it's really hard when the first thing to t you have to tackle is kind of a cultural norm around a mode of transportation. Um, so just to kind of, you know, take it slowly and step back and look at the ways that uh, you can approach that, um, because I don't think anybody really does have a good answer to how we can make walking and cycling seem more cool than driving. Um, one of the big challenges was having limited time with students. Um, we worked with students on a monthly um, and biweekly basis, oftentimes over lunch. So sometimes we would only have 20 minutes a month with the students, which is not a lot of time when you're trying to run a youth-led initiative. So we really worked on um, making sure that the students were, we were using the students' time to its fullest. Um, Decision, the idea of decision makers, that the students are not always the decision, the lead decision maker, that their parents really did still play a role and that uh, most high school students were not going to say no when their parents insisted on driving them to school. Um, so really looking at ways that you can branch out and work with, um, you know, parents, maybe through the parent council to spread messaging, uh, positive messaging about why you're promoting walking and cycling amongst their uh, their teenagers. Uh, one of the challenges was uh, getting students to walk the walk. I think I touched on this a little bit. Um, getting the students in the room to give it a try was a big challenge, but also one of the main rewards to actually see people um, start to really enjoy walking and biking. And finally, one of the challenges was the broad focus of the project and the long timeline. Um, and this would be something to keep in mind if you're thinking of starting a project. I think with the broad scope of encouraging walking and cycling over a two year time period, I think everyone kind of gra grappled with how to do that. So maybe really narrowing down your focus and picking right away one or two issues with the students to focus on would be very helpful. 
In terms of the lessons learned, um, I've mentioned this a couple of times, focusing on the students in the room and uh, what, uh, what their main concerns are and how you can address their barriers to walking and cycling. Um, getting students outside. As I mentioned before, um, students weren't necessarily concerned with uh, the safety or infrastructure piece, but as soon as we got outside on a walkabout or a bikeabout, it really all did start to come together and we were able to identify maybe intersections that were um, you know, needing repair or bike lanes that ended at roundabouts um, and work with decision makers to get that fixed. And then we had a good news story to bring back to the school community about this new infrastructure. So really working on getting outside with the students and exploring the environment by foot and by bike. Um, another key piece is to involve teachers and other role models. Students are already looking up to teachers. Um, they're coming to the same place, the same school. So it's great to get them walking and cycling and uh, providing that extra motivation for students to participate. Um, engaging parents is an important piece, as well as adapting to the context. Uh, we had, you know, successful events like the walk and roll challenge at one school that really just wasn't a good fit for another school that we tried it at. So, uh, you know, really listening to students and to the school and seeing what's worked for them in the past. Next slide, please. So this one, um, suggestions for youth engagement. This is for anyone in the room or online who's thinking about uh, starting a youth project. Um, and I actually, I think that they transition really well into any project, not just with youth, but uh, these are the things that uh, I learned along the way over our two year process. Um, definitely uh, being patient. Um, for a lot of youth, this is the maybe the first time that they'll be working on a youth-led project where they're being asked to take on a lot of the responsibility and execute tasks. This could be very new for them. They also have a lot of demands on their time. It is overwhelming how many clubs the students I was working with were a part of and they all had after-school jobs. So just really being patient and kind of slowing your expected timeline down is a really key factor, especially at the beginning so that there's not a lot of disappointment. Um, to always be creative and challenging and to present information in a fun way um, and recognizing that uh, you're not, you know, you're not necessarily addressing a group of people who already want to be walking and cycling. So kind of um, creating an environment where people feel safe being challenged and trying new things. Um, you, me, using meeting time effectively, as I mentioned, there's a lot of demands on student time. Uh, we really started to reevaluate the project and instead of just using meetings for kind of visioning and brainstorming and then sending students home with kind of tasks, we tried to get those tasks done during the uh, during the meetings, whether it be the creation of a banner or the development of a website, get that done during the meetings so that students aren't going away with extra homework because they already have a lot of homework. Um, being prepared for meetings. Um, a lot of times if you come with an idea, make sure that you have a backup idea so that you're not lost if the if your first idea doesn't go over well. Um, and kind of on the time on the uh, subject of ideas, this is one that I had to learn the hard way, um, but not all ideas need to be brought to life. At the same time as you want to create a positive environment where students can brainstorm and their ideas are accepted, um, you really want to step back and take some time and think about what the capacity of yourself and the group is to bring ideas to life um, because you want to make sure that uh, especially the first project is a real success to have students continue to come back to the table. Um, so if you take on something that's exciting but maybe a little bit too big or a little bit too ambitious for the first uh, project, um, it can be a real disappointment and stress for everyone involved. So really kind of assessing whether or not that idea is a great idea that should be shelved or a great idea that's manageable and can be undertaken within the timeline you've laid out. Um, you want to be very specific about the tasks that you assign to yourself and to the students so that everyone understands what, uh, what uh, is expected of them. And at the same time, celebrate student contributions. Um, so whether this be putting an announcement over when uh, you know there's a successful event, what I would often do if a student went above and beyond would be to offer to write them a reference letter um, because a lot of students are looking for that. They don't have their first job yet. They need credentials. Um, so just kind of asking students uh, what they need and making sure that they recognize that uh, their contributions are really appreciated. Um, one thing that I found worked really well was imitating previous successes. So being creative doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have a completely new, 100% new project every time you do something. Um, so asking students sitting down um, and saying, you know, what are some successful events that are annual at your school or that were really a success last year? How were they advertised? What was the, what was the location? Was there a cost? Just kind of imitating what has already been successful. 
And then lastly, I think one of the most successful pieces was connecting with stakeholders and inviting um, city planners and city councillors to come and meet with the students and really engage with them in their community. It made the students feel like they were being listened to, which they were, um, and it gave the city councillors a great idea and let them know that the, that the students, um, you know, even though they don't necessarily have time to come out to the evening open houses that cities often host to deal with planning issues, they very much do want to be engaged if you're willing to go, come to them. Next slide. Um, so this is my last slide. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. I hope that uh, some of the things that we learned from our pilot project here in Ottawa will be useful to you and resonate with the youth in the room or um, the uh, work, the professionals in the room who have worked on active transportation projects. Um, if you have any questions, that's uh, my contact information. And uh, if you wanted to learn more about school travel planning, as I mentioned, that's a project run by Green Communities Canada and Canada Walks. So their website, uh, saferoutestoschool.ca, is up there, and I encourage you to check that out if you want more information. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Jamie. I realize it's coming up on 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, Tuesday for you, so thanks again for joining us. Um, do we have any questions for uh, Jamie? Yes. Jamie, I was wondering in light of uh, Todd Lippmann's um, observation during his keynote this morning that, that um, as a status object, the car might be losing its, um, its shine and mobile connection might be more important to young people these days. I wondered if that has become at all part of your Green Communities initiative and if that came up amongst your, the students you worked with over the two years? <clears throat> how to stay connected and did that did that integrate with your project in any way sorry Amy are you able to repeat kind oh, of the yes, last part I, of the sorry the last time. <laughs> I wasn't um, able to hear she, Martha was asking you um, Todd Littman recently spoke earlier about the whole idea of a car being a status object and among mm -hmm. among teenagers and that instead um, now it looks like with the drop in in driving and licensure that that perhaps the mobile phone might might be um, um, due it might be due to having mobile access to to your phone um, did you have any that might be more important in fact than the status object of the car so based on <coughs> what he was saying earlier did that come out at all in your in the um, green communities project when you were talking to the teenagers or was it asked or a part of your project at all Right, that's a really good point. Um, and I think it's definitely something to consider and incorporate. Um, it didn't come out directly um, in terms of, you know, students talking about it. Um, what I noticed, though, is that especially I was actually fortunate enough to work at my old, my the high school that I attended when I was in high school as well. Um, and it seemed that, um, you know, maybe the car has dropped in status symbol, but um, it wasn't kind of manifesting itself in a way that students were walking and biking more. It was just that they were being driven to school by their parents. Um, so they didn't necessarily own that car as a status symbol. Maybe their phone was a status symbol um, that replaced that. I'm not sure we weren't asking that specific question, but it seemed more like students uh, were being dropped off and driven to school than actually owning cars themselves. Um, and that would kind of strictly be an observation. Um, when I was going to that school, everyone had their own car. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, only 10 years ago, but uh, it seems like the, the parking lot was a lot emptier um, and a lot of the students that we talked to were being driven to school. So I know that doesn't directly answer your question. It wasn't a question we were asking directly to the students, but uh, it didn't seem like car ownership was very high. Thank you. Thanks for that. Any other questions for Jamie? Well, thank you again so much for joining us, Jamie. Thank you. Are you going to go back to watch the symposium now? <laughs> yeah, I will. I'll okay. turn on the live stream. Well, round of applause for Jamie. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>